Good evening. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Alabama Association of Higher Education Diversity Officers Conference for 2021. My name is Paulette Patterson Dilworth, and I currently serve as the president of Alajado. To those of you who may be new to Alajado or who are joining us for the first time, I invite you to visit our website at alajado.org to learn more about us. Indeed, the work of this group is critically important to the wider issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and a sustainable development of successful educational outcomes at our institutions and our state. We're very grateful to Dr. Christine Taylor, conference planning chair, and her team at the University of Alabama Tuscaloosa for their persistence and support that they provided for planning our conference. As many of you are aware, Alajado's conference is typically held in the fall, but like other organizations, we found ourselves having to pivot and prioritize expectations due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I welcome all of the eminent speakers and guests around the state and the country who will join us to share their knowledge and vast experience with diversity, equity, and inclusion practice. The theme of this three-day conference, Power, Privilege, Equity and Voice, Critical Lessons from 2020 reflects the changing educational dynamics due to COVID-19, racial unrest, and the always shifting political climate. We acknowledge that every campus in our system has equally important role, has an equally important role to play in this endeavor. Every campus together as a system has the responsibility to challenge itself to do better in the spirit of continuous improvement so that every single one of our students has the opportunity when they come to Alabama schools to build their best life and to do it in an environment that is truly steeped in a culture of inclusive excellence. I look forward to hearing from you, the participants, about your experience here during these three days and to see how we might continue to move forward. Thank you again for, participa for your participation and always for your service and dedication to Alajado. And now I would like to introduce our conference chair and host, Dr. Christine Taylor, who serves as vice president and associate provost in the division of diversity, equity and inclusion at, at the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa. Take it away, Dr. Taylor. Thank you, Dr. Dilworth. Well, what an honor it is to have all of you here with us today. Uh, to borrow a, a title of a book, um, during this time, we've obviously had to teach the elephant to dance. You got that elephant roll talk. Anyway, we're glad that you're here and glad that you're here with us. We have designed what we think is gonna be three very powerful days that are gonna give you points of reflection, tools to do our work in a much more effective way and finally, a sense of renewed energy, which we all have a deep need for. And I'm so delighted and thankful for all those who are going to be joining us today. Uh, we've arranged the sessions to go 12 to 1.30 every day so that we can try to encourage and increase participation. So without further ado, I'm excited to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Brandon Wolf from the University of Alabama, who will introduce our guest and will begin our session today. Please enjoy the conference. Thank you very much, Dr. Taylor. Um, today's open session is entitled Leading in a Time of Crisis. We're joined by who I consider are two of the most prolific engaged scholars and leaders in the field, Dr. Kevin McDonald and Dr. Sharon Freeze Britt. Kevin McDonald currently serves as the University of Alabama's Vice President for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Community Partnerships. He joined UVA after serving as the Chief Diversity Officer and Vice Chancellor of Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity at the University of Missouri System and University of Missouri Columbia. Prior to the University, University of Missouri System and flagship campus, McDonald held positions in several other universities, including Vice President and Associate Provost for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Rochester Institute of Technology, Vice President for Equity and Inclusion at Virginia Tech, Associate Director for Compliance and Conflict Resolution at Johns Hopkins University and Campus Compliance Officer at the University of Maryland College Park. Dr. Sharon Freeze Britt is a Professor of Higher Education at the University of Maryland College Park in the Department of Counseling, Higher Education and Special Education. She is a University of Maryland Distinguished Scholar Teacher. Her research examines the experiences of high achieving Blacks in higher education 
underrepresented minorities in STEM fields and issues of race, equity, and diversity. Dr. Freeze Britt has been published widely with, within peer reviewed journals, and she has served on the editorial boards of the Journal of College Student Development, the Journal of Diversity in Higher Education, and the College Student Affairs Journal. Her research has been funded and supported by the Lumina Foundation, National Society of Black Physicists, and the National Science Foundation. Thank you for joining us and take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Wolf, and good afternoon, everybody. It is really a distinct honor uh, to be able to share, the, first of all, this uh, virtual platform with uh, a, a, a scholar, a, 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 a diversity leader, and a great friend in Dr. Sharon Fries Britt. And I'm incredibly grateful um, to Alohedi uh, for their work. Um, in the diversity field, I, I, I uh, as a regional chapter, I sit on the National Association for Diversity Officers and Higher Education Board, and I know our uh, president, um, um, Dr. Paula, um, uh, Paula Paulette Granberry Russell, uh, would be incredibly impressed uh, with this uh, showing. So, congratulations to the uh, conference planning committee and. Uh, deep uh, debt of gratitude to Dr. Christine Taylor uh, for the invitation uh, to join you all today. Let me just uh, pause for a minute because Dr. Friesbritt may want to give a welcome of her own and then we can kind of jump into the presentation. So thank you, um, my dear friend and colleague, uh, Dr. McDonald for that. I was thinking the same thing and wanted to do it later. The only regret I have is we don't get to see all your beautiful faces, but we feel your energy. So thank you for joining us. I also want to thank the planning committee, Dr. Taylor and all of her um, colleagues, Dr. Dilworth, Dr. Wolf and the entire team for inviting us. And also my colleague for inviting me to join him as part of this uh, presentation today. So thank you for joining us. We're looking forward to when we get to the point of really engaging your questions and your, your dialogue. Wonderful. So um, why don't we go ahead and get started. Okay, so uh, this topic, leading in times of crisis, is something that uh, Sharon and I have engaged uh, in uh, through our work at the University of Missouri, gosh, for a number of years now, it feels like. Um, and I am really appreciate uh, her for going on this journey with me uh, and our other colleagues and, and partners in this work in the American Council on Education, Adriana Kazar, another amazing scholar at the University of Southern California. So we want to talk a little bit about this case study uh, at the University of Missouri uh, and then talk a little bit about kind of bringing this forward in this time of racial reckoning, um, what we've grappled with even during my time at the University of Virginia, which I think many of us will be able to relate to. Want to present uh, just and provide an agenda and a kind of key context of where we're going to go with our presentation today. And, and Sharon, before I jump into the initial slides, I'll, I'll share some thoughts, but also want to pause just in case there is anything you want to add. But we wanted to take a look at this whole notion of of a crisis, how it develops, how it can turn and snowball into an avalanche, right? And regardless of whether it starts locally, regionally, nationally, or globally, what does that mean in our higher education context? And how are we grappling with that on our own respective institutions? The need for our campus uh, communities, our organizations to develop uh, the capacity to be able to uh, deal with a racial crisis when it happens on our respective campus. What does that mean? And how do we ultimately lean in uh, to the discomfort that is often existing um, to ultimately move this work forward and try to resolve what we can um, and move and, and create the healing that needs to take place uh, on our campus communities? This notion of just having a repertoire of skills for doing this DEI work, not only for us as, as diversity officers in the field, but for our leaders, for uh, our faculty, staff, and students, maybe for local community or alumni who are also engaging or want to roll up their sleeves and help out when, uh, again, these crises um, surface. And, and then lastly, the notion of shared learning opportunities. One of the reasons we did uh, and move forward with this case study at the University of Missouri was because we know that quite often when crises arise and we're, particularly when they hit home for us, um, we wanna keep that information in-house. It's very, uh, it's, it's challenging to uh, try to convince leadership to kind of open up the doors for learning experiences beyond our own organization. And we wanted to do that um, with this particular case study. And I'll also share um, some of the work 
particularly in the racial equity context um, at the University of Virginia. Sharon, anything else you wanna to add to this slide? I think you hit it all. I just wanna just emphasize two quick things. One is the Missouri community, I, I really always appreciate the gift you all gave us to the field to allow us to actually come in and study you. So this five-year process, you just can't underestimate because most of our campuses, like you just said, don't want to really let folks know what's, we wanna stay in-house. So that was a gift. And the other thing is, is that the building of capacity, I think what we learned from this work really needs to be um, all the way through before, during, and after. So that's the only thing I would add to it too, because I know we have a lot of ground to cover. Awesome, thank you. So let's just start a little bit of, of context, right? How do we even get to this whole case study at the University of Missouri? Um, part of it um, uh, for the university really started with the death of Mike Brown in 2014 in Ferguson, Missouri, right? You had a, a community that, were, that was reeling, um, you had protests um, that were surfacing, and you had students at the University of Missouri, particularly our black students who felt compelled to go down and support um, those protesters, that community um, that was reeling in Ferguson. This is a picture um, from the, the protest there in Ferguson. It's interesting and um, almost eerily similar to what we saw uh, during the kind of summer uh, of this, of, of last year, actually, uh, this past summer, right? Uh, it's interesting, you could actually sw swap out this picture and it could be some other place, some other context, some other protests that were ignited by George Floyd's death, Breonna Taylor's death and, and, uh, and others. Um, I, so I'm, I'm still always struck when I kind of look at this particular picture. But the students uh, at the University of Missouri started to reflect on their own experiences when they came back from supporting those protests. They started thinking about their own kind of um, context and, and a mistreatment, um, 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 the racial um, aspects that were happening at the institution, right? Um, the racism that they were enduring as students. And it really came to a head because the students really wanted to do something about it. Um, and so you can see here, um, it came to it at the homecoming parade. The students formed this human kind of chain, this link um, to block uh, the, the top motor car and that motorcade from going forward. Um, the, the, the person in the kind of gold yellow jacket, there was the president of the University of Missouri system. You can see him, he's kind of looking off a bit indifferent um, off to the right. Um, it's interesting at, at one point, the car even inches forward and ultimately kind of hits the students, but at no point in time did the president ever get out of the car and engage the students. That led to a hunger strike uh, by one of the students within the protesting group, which was called CS 1950. But it wasn't until the football team ultimately joined the protesting students and uh, um, kind of join the general population of students as student athletes um, that we have what we call kind of interest convergence when we talk about critical race theory. Right? The economic interest of the university um, came at stake because the, the football team decided that they were going to boycott their next game. Their next game was against Baylor, I think a pretty highly ranked team at the time. Um, and so with those, those economic interests, we saw from afar, I hadn't gotten to the University of Missouri at that time, but we knew that uh, something was ultimately going to happen um, as a result of that. And as a result of that, the president of the University of Missouri system and the chancellor of that flagship campus there in Columbia ultimately resigned. So I'm just fast forwarding now when I think about um, the, the deaths of the like, late spring and, and the level of uh, racial reckoning that organizations across our nation and quite honestly our world were going through, the level of organizational and, and individual reflection um, of that. Um, we went through that as well at the University of Virginia, thinking about its own complex history, right? Rooted in slavery, rooted in eugenics, um, and what that meant for our organization and this desire to kind of be better and do better um, at the time, right? We think about those kind of protests and the demands that um, went across um, this continuum, right? From defunding to beliefs to other things, but you can see um, this reflection um, across our nation, right? Pushing and fighting for racial justice. And this is a picture um, by the Thomas Jefferson statue uh, at the University of Virginia. So just bringing this from my perspective home to a, to an, uh, a higher ed context, right? You all may have also um, 
had protests on and some level of, of heightened activism on your respective campuses as well. So um, let me um, pick up from where Kevin just left off on just sort of the um, range of issues that we know we've all been dealing with. And I wanted to share, and many of you may be familiar with um, Second Lieutenant Richard Collins, who actually um, graduated post hominously from Bowie State University, but was a distinguished member of the armed services. And he was actually stabbed to death on our campus, University of Maryland College Park, by a white male student who um, has ties to the alt-right community. And this was happening obviously in 2017, right at the height of just sort of a revisiting of anti-white uh, uh, anti, um, white supremacist activities on campuses. And on our campus, we had a lot of different signals as well. I won't go through all of them, but we certainly had a lot of signs and posters. And so um, I wanted to share this particular case with you for several reasons. It links to this notion of capacity building and how all of our campuses are likely to either have had events, will have events, or are dealing with events right now. And when Lieutenant um, Richard Collins was murdered on our campus, it was right at, at the time I was doing this work with the University of Missouri. And we, we mentioned that case, if you had a chance to look through the pre-reads. But the real point is that it's how do we on our campuses um, feel ourselves to be prepared to handle these crises when, they're ha when they happen. This is one of those unexpected early in the morning standing at a bus stop visiting friends at University of Maryland. It could happen anywhere and on any of our campuses, particularly these days as there's an increased amount of um, real hate violence that's happening for students on the campus. Several things that link as I move, move you to what we learned at University of Missouri um, and to connect it to the Richard Collins case is that our campus has been dealing with a lot of the follow-up work of how do we heal after this? How do we bring Bowie State University, University of Maryland, which is a historically black college in our state, really right down the road, 11 miles from us. And it really helped us to think about how we were trying to really connect and do our social alliance work with that campus. And we're just in the beginning stages of that there have been lots of things that have happened in, in that process of moving us forward. So I share that because when we did this work as a result of the University of Missouri, and I really can't thank um, Kevin, Dr. McDonald enough because it takes the vision of someone who is both in practice, understands the real work we're doing on the ground and the connection of research academic work that might inform the field. Um, I started my career in administration and I often say that when I do my work as an academ academic, it's really important that it has some meaning and practice. And when Kevin really pulled all three of the players together, ACE, the researchers, myself and Dr. Kizar, and then his team, really to open up the space, it really allowed us to say, what are we gonna be able to learn from this that all of our campus can relate to? And capacity building um, really has its roots, and Kevin, you can turn to the, to the next one. It has its roots, and, and these are some of the findings not only out of Missouri, but also out of our work in the field. It has its roots in understanding our context that we, all of our campuses, where we're all working and, and whether it's, and even outside of higher ed, but today we're talking at higher education, but the context matters for our capacity building. So we certainly learned at the University of Missouri and we, and I'm sure you think about this, all of our campuses have this, there was some distinctiveness about that case. You know, what was happening within, on the campus itself and how the media was interpreting the history of Mizzou, the way in which the state context and, and alumni and legislators were um, having an impact on the kinds of decisions that were being made mattered. And certainly at that time, and we see it now, the national context was brewing for sure. And here we are now, as you just saw with Kevin's opening slides, um, a lot of national context. And so what one of the things that we wanna say to you is that context has to always be thought, um, thought in the process of how we build capacity. So essentially in, in, in our work, we identified five key areas of capacity. These will not be a surprise to any of you all. They're not intended to be a surprise. They're intended to say to folks, here is a basic sort of foundation of, of key things that we have to have in place. Our primary argument is you gotta go past these. So let me just be real clear and you'll see that in the next slide in a minute. But what we've, what we've identified is that if a campus is not doing strategic planning, thinking about its values and guiding itself in that arena, it, that's problematic. It has to have leadership expertise on the campus. And leadership expertise we define and think about in our work, not just in traditional vertical le um, leadership expertise by position, but also preparing people up and down the organization with leadership capacity around this and capability around this topic. But certainly to have CDO, chief diversity officers or other senior leaders who take on this portfolio, even if they don't have the same position. So those folks certainly are critical. A third one is building trust and respect across all groups that you have to have community in place, the building of community. 
the investment of the campus in everyone's learning. And so much of our emphasis is on our students and staff. We have a tremendous amount of work to do in the education of faculty, of boards of trustees, of alumni, like our educational arm and learning around DEI space is just beginning. And then an evaluation assessment process. So Kevin, if you turn, just to give you all a general sense, in our work, what we argue is that it is important for campuses, it's not so much that we're saying you, that this is an evaluation tool, but it ought to be a guide for you to think about where's your capacity? Is it low, is it moderate and high? And there may be some parts, some seasons where you have high capacity. Your campus is doing really great work. You have the right kind of leaders in place, the right kind of fiscal support, programmatic support, et cetera. But that can turn very quickly on a dime. And so if you turn to the next slide, part of what we're saying to folks is, take a look at your capacity across the board. So this may be hard for you to see, and we'll provide slide the slide deck for you all after our presentation, but let me just give you a couple of quick examples. For low capacity, it would be what you would expect. Campuses are doing just scratching the surface, minimal things, or, or things may be non-existent. So they may not have a lot of depth in their leadership or knowledge around DEI issues. There may not be a DEI plan, um, et cetera. So there's like maybe next to nothing or very little. A lot of campuses, when I'm out in the field doing my work and, and, and working with people about what they have in place, what I learn is they're at moderate capacity, some range of moderate. We certainly found that the University of Missouri um, was at low moderate when um, a lot of things were happening and we felt in our second visit back, they were actually moving up in high moderate capacity. And that really just means that there is the depth, deeper dive into the kind of work that's happening around building up these five areas. The big difference is in high capacity and high capacity not only has a strong clip in all five of these areas, but it really begins to look at the kind of ways in which there's systemic policies, practices that are oppressive or anti-racist or anti-black that are inequalities in a system. And so you really can't consider yourself to be a campus that's doing high capacity work if you're not dismantling these oppressive systems. Um, so that's a critical piece of building out your capacity in the stages of your capacity. And we'll and I'll welcome and we'll talk um, when we get to Q&A more about that if folks have questions. So a big part of the Missouri case was learning how they recovered and going back some 18 months later to find out about the recovery process. And some really important things came out of that process. The first is um, we certainly knew that they were dealing with a lot of trauma, fatigue, distrust, and, and anger from the critical incidents that were happening that, that Dr. McDonald went over. What we found in our second visit is that the emotional trauma doesn't completely go away. There are other kinds of ways in which these emotions are also surfacing. So for all of our campuses, what I would argue and say to you about recovery is that we, our campuses and all of us in them are continually being um, dealing with the trauma of these incidents, whether they're happening on our campus or in those contexts that I just mentioned earlier. So trauma frameworks are really helping us to better understand that. And this is, comes out of Saul's work and stay right there, Kevin. It, it comes out of Stol Saul's work. No, 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 you can go ahead and dance, thank you. This comes out of Saul's work, both the trauma framework and the recovery. And we turned as a research team to the trauma framework in part because it, what, it is traumatic when we're having racial incidents or sexual assaults or other kinds of crises that happen on our campus. So what Saul argues in the recovery process, and we thought this was a very useful framework, and I won't hit all of the pieces, but I'll summarize them, is that there are three key things that happen that have to happen in our roles as leaders working with our campus in recovery. One is our ability to really truly actively listen. listen. And we all think we're listening sometimes, but sometimes we're pay not paying attention to the extent we're re really thinking more about what we're going to say next. And so active listening is a real skill and a process that we have to really develop a skill around and that governance of two-way communication and being really open and not defensive. So again, you can, when, when we share these with you, you'll get each of these points, but it's just the highlights is to understand that we have to be in a state of being able to identify what's going on for people, the kind of resources they need, understand what it really is happening for them and create the kind of dialogue and listening process where we're learning um, in that recovery, especially in the immediacy um, right after an incident happens. So next slide. This one, I do wanna hit each of those points because I think speaking from the heart um, has become really when we're out in the field and I know many of you have heard this or experienced this, people want, our, a lot of our staff in our community want to see evidence 
that we are understanding what is happening, even if we don't have an answer that we're able to understand that. And so speaking from the heart shows up in a couple of ways. One is owning the racism and um, that is the history of our nation and of, of our campuses and the way in which that racism continues to manifest and impact the day-to-day -day operations. Being able to dialogue on racial healing, be able, being able to, first of all, hear the dialogue and being able to be engaged and be able to um, uh, be a, a space for that dialogue to happen as a leader that we are really speaking from the heart and being, even if what you have to say from the heart is, I am not fully at the place I wanna be in my ability to talk about this, but I am learning, I am trying to, really go deeper in my sense of. So being able to articulate and have those skills as a leader become important. Celebrating students and their courageous leadership. Oftentimes it's our students who are doing a lot of this work. And then also just really defining what our campus value and communities are around this. So the last one in this particular framework, and I'll summarize these that we have to be much more in a, peer, in a recovery process of acting with people. Too often we're coming in with uh, a top-down approach around what's gonna happen. So democratic leadership, shared leadership, taking um, risk in the conversations and in what we're expecting people to deliver in their um, work that we're asking them to do to really amplify the work that's being done on campus to celebrate uh, um, oftentimes as many of the folks who are joining us today who are actually doing that dig, that um, deep dive work and we really need to reward that. We need to understand that that work isn't just happening with the ease at which sometimes you all make it seem easy, but that it requires a kind of skill and that we have to, when we're asking people to have the skills to act with and be with folks, that's a particular repertoire of skills. And we need to have our leaders understand how to reward that and how to be um, appreciative of that kind of work. So next slide. So in the, in the, um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm watching the time, so I'm gonna slow down just a little bit because I think we're good on time um, to just um, make some observations about the Weaver leader. The in the second report, one of the things that we spent time on, besides how do you recover and how do you be with people, is what does leadership mean after crisis, or 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 not even just after crisis, but in our in our on our campuses today. And one of the quotes that um, we really liked, and I'm gonna get Kevin to go ahead and turn, um, one of the quotes that really came from the ACE leadership at the time, Ted Mitchell and Laurel Espinosa, really I think captured, and I'm gonna take a moment to just read this, it really captures um, the essence of what I think is important today. And what they offered in their opening letter is that the Weaver Leader model represents a leadership challenge to, who, to those who see community engagement as transactional in nature. The leadership qualities embedded, embodied by the Weaver leader instead embrace community as an enterprise of shared expectations built on mutual trust, transparency, and a healthy level of vulnerability. Unfortunately, such leadership is not typically developed or encouraged amongst higher ed leaders, thus requiring intentional growth and development. I really, we had no idea they were gonna make this statement, but what I love about that is I think it is spot on for the challenges, how we have traditionally prepared leaders is not to be um, as to not have they don't have the skills. We have struggled with having the skills of being in these very vulnerable um, spaces of of racial crises. So if you um, turn, I won't read this quote. You'll see it, but the essence of what we um, are saying in our work here is that again, it's built on relationship, and that we use the metaphor of weaving together a tapestry on our campus. So even the incidents that happen that are negative, they're a part of our story and we have to be able to um, see all of the perspectives of everyone on a campus. And again, we think of leadership, my colleagues and I and the team, we see leadership as happening broadly and not just in those traditional um, positional leaderships. So what we found at University of Missouri and what I think happens on a lot of our campuses is that there's tremendous fragmented views. We see it in our larger society, so no surprise there. But what I think is important, and although at, at University at Mizzou, it, the fragmented views were on race, on how, how long someone had been on campus. So if you'd been on your campus for a long time, you, weren't, you had a different set of expectations about what you needed to see and, and the degree of trust you would have in what the leadership may or may not have been doing. Uneven work experiences, um, a lot of disconnect, disconnected chains of action of who gets to do what next and what's the flow. And so just different, all kinds of ways in which people had different expectations around the kind of information they were getting and differing, differing views there. And so a fragmented worldview and part of what I say to leaders 
on their campuses now is become aware of what yours are. That means taking the time to be with you on the ground with your folks to find out what those views are. Every campus has them. So we'll go to the next slide. And managing the tensions, and I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit, managing the tensions is also important because the truth of the matter is, is that we never really get to a place where everybody is going to be happy with everything. So there are a host of tensions that were on the Mizzou campus, and certainly if you think of your own campus around the extent to which people were felt impatient with progress, whereas other people felt like the campus had come a long way to um, the, the uh, ways in which we should do DEI work. I'll just pick a couple on here. Some people felt like it was an add-on, like Mizzou was just doing things to add on. Other people felt like, no, it's deeply integrated. We're doing, we're, the change in leadership is, is deeply committed to these issues. Again, on our own campuses, we really need to know and acknowledge those tensions and learn what they're, even the ones that make us uncomfortable, because those are the ones that are gonna give us a, a, the entree into understanding where the work needs to happen. So yeah, can I add in one, um, this is such an incredibly valuable slide. When I think about those who may be um, on this uh, Zoom experience that are working in the diversity space, when you add in the fragmented worldview with um, those that are comfortable or maybe want to move this forward, these different perspectives, these kind of tensions, you also add in this additional layer of complexity of us being in this role of DEI trying to manage that, right? We're trying to kind of navigate this during a time of crisis. And that's, that's really a heavy lift. That's really hard. So when you reflect on this um, from your own perspectives of doing the work and think about how we are trying to navigate this with the precision of a surgeon, um, that be, uh, it, it almost feels overwhelming to think uh, about our work in that context. But I think you've really captured it when you think about the, the various tensions on our respective campuses. Yeah, but I'm glad you said that. And I think one of the ways it helps is if you know your campus's tensions in advance, um, being able to articulate that and prime your community, prime your leadership, your smaller group that you're working with to say that, so that first of all, you're even aware and keeping them abreast of that to say, you know, we're learning, and that's hard for leaders to hear. On my own campus, I just tried to have that conversation with senior leadership team. And, you know, it was almost like I was bringing bad news. It was like, you know, we don't want no more bad news. And it wasn't that I was trying to bring bad news. I was trying to help the campus understand there is something that we ought to keep an eye towards that's brewing over here. So you're right. It's hard to navigate when we're in the middle of it and trying to be a voice of reason and, and give direction there. And by the way, for public institutions, you add in this additional layer when you put in the state legislature and their oh, expectations, God. and that's that's a whole nother thing. So I know there's probably some people on the Zoom call just put their hands up like, oh my goodness, don't even go there. But exactly. And we want to hear when we get to the part of opening this up, uh, you know, the reality check. I mean, the truth of the matter is these kind of projects and these kind of guide um, uh, uh, concepts and guidelines are just that. I mean, the real world, and that's again what I was attracted to with the project is that um, what we were trying to, to really merge was the reality of the work and can we come up with something that helps people navigate it. So it may not fit perfectly, but it gives you at least a starting point um, to add on to what you are already doing. And so um, again, another part of where we emerged out of our work with um, the University of Missouri was really in developing this notion of a Weaver Leader framework and uh, it really centers at the core around creating shared expectations. And this is not easy work. Like how do we begin to get our campus community um, understanding, first of all, what our expectations are gonna be? Like, how are we doing this work? And those, the changing nature of those expectations, is it a co-constructive process? How do you do that? And how do you really continue to um, build the relationships with uh, on and off the campus, not just with campus um, community? And, and Kevin, you might wanna speak to this, but you all did a lot of that relationship building also in the community of Missouri, Columbia, and that matters. And so how do you link a campus with the immediate community and other stakeholders in these other contexts? Um, and so there's a lot I could say about that, but the most important thing is knowing that these three elements, like the expectation setting, the building relationships and constant communication in a way that's effective, that's transparent, that's very um, real and keeping people informed with what, um, obviously there's certain things that are confidential that we can't put in the public space, but the extent to which people are um, being as transparent about what can be shared at a given time and when things are coming matters. And so in the larger report, we say a lot more about that, but I'm gonna stop here as we transition because one of the things that you know Kevin and I talked about is how do we begin to move some of this into the reality of 
the next stages. So I'm gonna turn it back to him and he will take us home with that. Great, thank you so much, uh, Sharon, for that. That was great information. Actually, um, it's actually uh, a, a, a great transition uh, to the, our work at the University of Virginia. So during this time of racial reckoning, um, this past summer, late spring, you know, a lot of uh, of our organizations were really grappling with uh, the 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 deaths, the murders in the Black community, and ultimately our own kind of place and opportunity to move. Uh, racial equity work forward. And the University of Virginia was no different um, uh, in its racial reckoning and wanting to be better, do better, wanting to lean into the discomfort of recognizing the own complexity of its own history rooted in slavery, like I said, rooted in eugenics, rooted in um, a, a, a community that had strong distrust uh, uh, because of the uh, the historic extractive nature of the University of Virginia and really wanting to create a, a, a stronger partnership, um, co-create, uh, uh, just create new kind of platforms that would allow us to build that. And so any, uh, the Anna K E. Casey Foundation came out with this um, seven steps to advancing racial equity and inclusion and, and action guide. And um, again, we'll provide our um, our, uh, a PDF of our presentation, but I would encourage you to, to look that up because without even knowing it, the University of Virginia actually went through these steps in its own kind of racial equity work. At the time, the president um, had uh, made a statement after um, the death of George Floyd that wasn't received well in the community. And we had a conversation and it kind of fell flat and he wanted to revisit that conversation. And uh, I was there to try to help as a diversity officer because I wasn't necessarily engaged in the first um, uh, 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 response that went out to the community. And one of those things that I said we needed to do moving forward was to charge a racial equity task force with really looking at racial equity at the University of Virginia, um, looking at, at past demands and, and recommendations um, um, by past students that went back 50 years that uh, the alums were telling us the university had never addressed. Uh, and, and to ultimately try to create an aggressive timeline uh, that timeline that ultimately became two months um, from the time that we launched it on June 1st and, uh, and to create a small but nimble uh, uh, task force of which I was one of three members um, to create that. And, and part of that uh, and kind of thinking about this first step was try to establish an understanding of racial equity and inclusion kind of principles, try to create a shared language uh, at the university because many people were kind of approaching this work differently. Some just wanted to focus on diversity. Some, the, the notion of centering kind of racial equity was a bit foreign to some. And part of that conversation, I'll just utilize some of these slides from the Center for Urban Education at the University of Southern California because I think it's just um, appropriate. Uh, in this particular case, they utilize this in the, the, the kind of focusing on students. But when Part of it for us was kind of thinking about different terminology from equality to equity and um, the layers of that, right? So this notion of equality being imagining uh, the world is equal, right? But also kind of recognizing that the world isn't equal, right? And that there are disparities that exist. You have your haves and have nots. You can see here, again, this kind of depicted um, dealing with students, some who have the scholarships and uh, maybe come from a middle to upper class background, took honors courses and AP credits, and those that didn't, they, maybe they came from poorly funded schools or less skilled teachers or um, huge ratios that served to their detriment or truncated um, curriculum. And then you add in this additional layer of bias and systemic racism, right? Um, and, and look at the kind of impact of that, particularly when you add in notions of microaggressions versus microaffirmations, which we need more of, right? Implicit bias and disproportionate remediation, which serves in and of itself, you know, as a stigma um, to students. Uh, and, and then this notion of kind of predominantly marginalized racial ethnic groups that are in that particular category. And then you put on this um, benign notion of, of wanting to increase the compositional diversity within our own organizations, but recognizing that um, that access is often bringing um, uh, that diversity into an unequal pathway, right, from the start. And so if you don't ultimately think about this from the standpoint of equity, um, this redirecting, redirecting of resources to pathways to, uh, with the greatest need to fix barriers and intentionally provide support, 
then um, you continue to, to enter into this vicious cycle, which really serves to the detriment of the desired outcomes um, we want. We know in the field that means that we can't look at data aggregated. We have to actually look at it disaggregated and analyze it to see what stories it's telling us to identify those areas of affirmation and areas of opportunity to move forward. How do you set goals and, 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 and action plans and build in accountability um, to do this work to ensure that it's going to move forward? Um, can, I, can I just jump in yeah, real quick? Please. That What you're um, covering right now really so ties to the capacity building that is at the highest clip. So this is the, and often in working with groups, like figuring out um, within your context, and in various ways, this may be different across campuses. What are the things that are serving as impediments that really do need to be um, looked at and the kind of data that needs to be collected? So this is very critical to building the high capacity kind of environments that we're talking about. Right, and to be clear, we know on our campuses, there are those that um, are gonna be comfortable with the status quo and those that want to move this work forward, but those in moving it forward will look at this and say, gosh, this is hard work. This is such a heavy lift. Or it's going to ultimately highlight uh, an area, and does that mean I provided poor leadership? So it's thinking about all of those things, kind of um, managing um, that um, in, in our space. Uh, and so then next, we, we recognize that a small uh, three-person task force, we had to engage. One of our critiques was that we had two uh, black male new leaders, a dean and then myself, who uh, a de the dean came right after, maybe a month after me, we had um, a white woman who um, provided leadership at the for the equity center who was really engaged in the work, but we didn't have a black woman on there. And that was one of the main critiques um, of our task force. And so we had to both own that and then make sure that we were casting the net far and wide to engage. I think we engage well over a thousand stakeholders um, at the university to kind of gather information on their views of racial equity, either during their time um, or as they think about uh, the University of Virginia. Uh, we had to look at data disaggregated, as I kind of mentioned before in that example with students, um, and analyze that. Again, over 50 years of protest and demand, some great heavy lifting, some great work was actually done on the backs of many of the students who were, were here at the time and had since graduated, and it challenged the university because they hadn't felt that the university had fully responded um, to those demands. Um, we talked a lot about this, um, trying to move beyond kind of uh, 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 identifying, um, you know, surface level um, pieces, but to really try to figure out what is the root causes versus the symptoms um, of the inequities and how could we ultimately address that? We had to ask ourselves some specific questions like what are the racial inequities involved? What organizational units specifically are involved maybe in promoting those racial inequities? What unfair policies um, are involved? What are other conditions or compounding dynamics um, are involved? And then what solutions or interventions could eliminate the inequities, right? Thinking about, again, the root causes that if we could eliminate, would eliminate those inequities. We had to identify strategies and the kind of target resources to address root causes. And this was hard, right? Part of it was the notion of identifying them. And then the lift was, well, who's gonna provide the human and financial resources to ultimately eradicate them, right? And, and that uh, the president challenged us to be bold and be bold we definitely were, right? I mean, our, our recommendations probably totaled easily $500 million. Um, for the institution. And we expected a certain amount of that to go on into perpetuity. So um, thinking about, again, those strategies, but not being afraid um, to kind of challenge and ask those questions. And some of the questions that we asked were kind of in this space were like, what racial disparities do you want to eliminate, reduce, or prevent? What stakeholders most adversely affected um, by the current problem do you really want most to benefit from these resources? Um, how does the proposed solution address, again, the root causes? So if we get these resources, um, are they really going to ultimately address the symptom and mass that are ultimately kind of get down to the root causes? And, and lastly, is there uh, sufficient funding, staffing, reporting, accountability, and an evaluation to ensure success? So we didn't want to um, just throw resources at something to see what would stick, but we ultimately wanted to make sure we had an evaluative process that uh, we believed would 
ensure success. And this is kind of where we are right now, right? Conduct racial equity impact assessments of our policies and decision making. We did that at the University of Missouri as well. We actually brought in a third party to ultimately audit all of our policies at the university. And there are, through the University of Missouri system, there are quite a number. But to be able to look through that with an equity um, lens was really important to think about whether when they were ultimately created, um, were there these unintended inequitable impacts, um, even along racial lines. And so we're at that point right now at the University of Virginia being able to kind of look at that. Uh, and it was, it's been amazing to see some organizations step up like finance. I've never had a, a, a finance um, division step up and say, we want to go through that level of reflection and have a racial equity impact audit um, of our um, organization. Um, but thinking about some of those questions that you would ask there, like a systemic, this is kind of this systemic examination of how the proposed action or decision will likely affect different racial and ethnic groups. Um, you want to use this as a vital tool to reduce, eliminate, and prevent racial discrimination and inequities. And this tool can kind of be used to assess proposed policies, institutional practices, programs, plans, and budgetary decisions. Again, all of which are uh, many of our campuses um, are, are a bit skittish with kind of leaning into. And then lastly, this notion of evaluation. Again, you, you have to kind of as assess what will you um, are expecting and reflecting within your organization and, and being able to kind of hold yourselves accountable with doing some of that. And, and ultimately, I also subscribe to th this notion of building in an impact report. So even in your evaluative process of the things that you said that you were going to do, what's been the impact of those and kind of holding yourself um, accountable um, for doing something uh, with that. And so when we think about questions that might be associated with this, that might be questions like, um, are all racial ethnic groups who are affected by the policy practice decision at the table, right? Of course, part of, a part of the decision-making process. It's interesting when at the University of Missouri, the students told me they didn't want it to be just um, utilized for issue identification. They actually wanted to also be utilized for um, solution identification. So how are those most affected actually being involved and engaged in, in this kind of racial equity process? I think that was really apparent as well during our work and, and that continues at the University of Virginia. Another question might be, how will the proposed policy practice decisions affect each group? So again, being able to have, ask those important questions that take you back to the disaggregation is gonna be incredibly important. Um, how maybe, how will the proposed policy practice decisions be perceived by each group? So for that, it also requires this continuous check-in, right, with the group to make sure they're aware of what is going, um, what's happening, what's being implemented, and making sure that their um, perceptions, which is ultimately going to be their reality, are taken into consideration. Um, and then lastly, based on those responses uh, to those questions that I just posed, what it, revisions might be needed in any of your policies or practices or decision makings um, that need to be under discussion. So again, just thinking about that um, from the evaluative process. Um, let me stop there. We have kind of resources that we've offered, but we can kind of now kind of open it up to, to questions. So, Kevin, before we go to questions, yeah, can yeah. I say, um, just before we go, I'm sorry, Dr. Wolf, can I just say something on, so I, we have like a few minutes before we go to questions. I want to, I wasn't sure if we were going to have time to do this, so I want to um, just put this out there for the audience, and this may or may not um, hit for folks, but as we've been out doing this work since the Missouri case, there are a couple of things that have come up in audiences that I wanna just raise around leading in times of crisis. One is this whole notion of oftentimes those of you all out there in the audience who are doing this work is, uh, is the real issue of racial battle fatigue and health and wellness. So I wanna put a layer that didn't come up directly in the Missouri work, although it did indirectly for sure come up, but, the, but it's important to emphasize that as we're leading in these times of crisis that how are we taking care of ourselves? How are we learning how to, what are the practices that are in place on, in both the daily way, but also uh, in the long run? There's some real loss of life that is happening in tenfold time. And so we can't underestimate that in how we lead. And the other thing real quickly is that um, as I've been presenting and I think about the frameworks we just talked about, um, Rightfully so, there's been a great dialogue that's been happening around the, the colonized way in which we keep coming up with solutions and that we need to decolonize some of the ways in which we strategize around dealing with these issues. 
And I completely, I've been in conversations with um, academic colleagues around taking Franz Fanon's work and other scholars work. And there are scholars who do decolonization work because we tend to in higher education replicate the same practices and replicate the same language. And sometimes that in and of itself is problematic. And so I recognize that even in the work we've done, it doesn't solve all of those issues. It actually replicates some of the ways in which the language um, privileges um, pretty much a sort of white colonized way in which we've all been socialized. And we have to own that because in a multi-generational work environment like a college campus, where there's easily three generations of people working, if not four, the young, we're getting pushed um, to think strategically about doing things differently and not just repeating the pattern. So, um, uh, sorry, that wasn't planned. I know my colleague, he may, get, he may hit me no, over no. the head. That's great, great, but I wanted to put that out there. Yeah, I wanted to, can we roll with that just for a quick second? Because I think um, you're absolutely right. When I think about the battle fatigue, not just for, for the, 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 the faculty, the staff, um, doing that work. I also think about um, the, the toll that it takes on our students. One of the things, if we connect that even with the racial trauma that impacted some of the decisions um, here at the University of Virginia was the student telling us the, the level of, of fatigue in trying to fight um, for progress and for change on a daily basis and the layered trauma with kind of passing um, um, representation of that racism on a daily basis from names of buildings and, and statues and the like. And, and the, 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 the cost, quite honestly, even for the activism. I remember a student coming into my office at the University of Virginia and I asked him how he was doing and you saw, and you, um, particularly in the wake of the protest. And he said, you know, um, there's a cost to this work. You know, I think he said that that semester um, that he, he was really engrossed in that he like had a GPA of, of that year of that semester, of like a 1.6, something crazy. And he had aspirations of going to law school. And he said, you know, I, I'm just spent. I don't know if I have anything else to give. And, and I, um, no one kind of takes care of us, you know, as a result. And so we know that um, fighting for change has its cost. Um, and, and he said that he didn't know if, if he had it to do over again, would he do the same thing, which I think is interesting. And the last thing I'll say, because I've, I, I think in the moment we're in, I, I've seen the, um, organizations do this virtually, but the, but the University of Missouri created, a, um, there were actually um, PhD counseling students that created this thing right. called um, racial healing circles, right? And, and it, I think probably still go on, are still going on to this day and, and comprised of faculty, staff, students, and even community members. But I know that there are organizations doing that virtually, which I think is awesome um, and thinking about because it's so necessary. It, it, that's uh, the community there said it was like the neosporin that they needed, right, um, for them to get through this period of time. So let me stop there. But I think you're absolutely right, uh, Sharon, for adding that. So um, let's, I mean, I think this is a tremendous point and it's gonna actually lead me to my first question, um, I wanted to become involved in DEI. However, I'm not sure anymore since much of it seems to be all talk without the executive support needed for success. These recent surge in DEI programs slash CDL hires seem to be a quick response to quell rising tensions that then once it comes, it well, once it calms, is back to business as usual. How do you drive a culture to change when it really doesn't want to? Mm. Yeah, that's the um, that's the million dollar question, and and, and I, I mean I think the question um, hits a, a nail on the head that does exist in some organizations right now. Granted, my my position at the University of Missouri was created out of it was one of the the demands, right? It was created out of the demands, and one of the things um, that we need to make clear going into these roles is what is that institutional. So support, right? Um, kind of identifying what we think we're going to need um, to be successful. Now, granted, sometimes you're going to succeed in spite of maybe a lack of continued support because you will have um, additional layers that will want to get back to the way things were, right? I was dealing with a, a state legislature that actually um, the, 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 the financial hit to the University of Missouri, they said it was upwards of $200 million when you add in the, the drop in enrollment, a state legislature that cut their budget that said they were mad at them for letting the inmates run the asylum. Um, so there are a number of things that you have to navigate um, just facts, right? Um, but you do want to try to be in situations 
where you have that have you where you have that support. I've been in situations where I've had it and it's amazing. Um, I've also been in situations where I haven't and I've had to be very politically savvy and strategic in, in my approach in navigating that and working with cross-functional partners and trying to build up support like the old Verizon commercials. Can you hear me now? And <laughs> all these people behind you. So I will say um, both are incredibly valuable um, and and, um, and there are those that, that can become discouraged if they you know don't have it and are, are don't want to navigate in trying to navigate that any any longer right they don't have the 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 the, the wherewithal and the sustenance and the desire to do that and that's one of the challenges for sure you know what i what i would add to that because our colleague who asked the question is absolutely right that that's that is the million dollar question but i take a long view you have to take a long view in this work and and i both a long and a short view i look to see um, what it is that I'm doing and how am I trying to push the ball or move the needle in a way that's helping either students or colleagues or staff. And so you have to look at sort of this, the, the quick wins, but also the longer view of cultural change. Um, higher education is a um, slow moving traditional industry that doesn't just, um, you know, with its cultures and values. But I also look at when things are shifting in our, in the larger context of our society. So we're in a different wave right now and I'm holding people accountable to some of that. I mean, some folks have jumped all out, put up flags saying they're gonna eradicate racism. So I'm reminding them, you know, we're in this, that we're in this, on this journey, on this path. And it isn't gonna happen with some checkbox. It's not gonna happen just because you wrote a strategic plan. So um, it takes endurance and it takes the um, work that we have to have in terms of collaborating with our colleagues. So yeah, it's not a job, it's not a kind of work that everybody might not wanna do if you're passionate about it. Um, many of us are very passionate about it. That doesn't mean we don't get exhausted and we don't get frustrated, but we see a purpose in it. And, and I think our long-term vision around it, over time, you see where your work has made a difference. I can certainly see where 40 some odd years in this career where the work can make a difference as I've seen my colleagues out there um, doing it. So it, you, you just have to stay the course with it. Brandon, can I also say, I, I, um, I benefited. One of the things we don't talk about, there are often uh, as well, um, diversity office that will get into this role and try to navigate that on their own, yes. right? Um, and, and that is a recipe for success. I um, benefited greatly, what really was developed to over 20 year um, friendship from um, um, scholar practitioners like Sharon, who when I entered the uh, my higher education uh, experience at the University of Maryland College Park, uh, she along with other just well-respected um, uh, faculty and staff members who knew the University of, of Maryland College Park far better than I, um, but w um, possessed a willingness to give me information that would, would help me succeed if I was willing to accept it, right? And, and I remember they always said, don't worry about paying this back, always pay it forward, right? And I also think we need to do more of that in the field because that for me sure to be on a great path of looking for cross-functional partners at every institution I want, went, because I wanted every place to be just like the University of Maryland at College Park, but, but it was because of amazing just colleagues and friends um, like Sharon and others um, that really um, um, just gave me valuable information. They were so great at, um, assets to me that, um, that it just helped me navigate my work more often than not with success during my time. So another question, um, I've heard of servant leadership before, but never weaver leadership. Can you talk about how you see this ideal of weaver leadership as a more powerful or useful tool? Um, great question, and I appreciate the question. So we came into this concept of Weaver leader intentionally out of this work to say that, and we use the metaphor of building a, tra uh, a tapestry, weaving a tapestry, that in order to do out of that metaphor, a tapestry allows for all things to be included, allows for all things to have value and worth. And so it doesn't, it's not void of servant leader, it definitely a servant, you're, you're, it's a combination of looking at how do I understand and um, realize the perspectives and the positions of a lot of people on my campus or in my division, in my unit, and try to be reflective of that and work with those communities. And so a Weaver leader is able to see in racial diversity work, the important perspectives that have to be shared across communities and between and among communities. And that in and of itself is serving the community. So your leadership is not about you doing the work, it's about you understanding the work that needs to be done and the perspectives that your community has and to be able to stand with and above and around people, but also um, be able to connect the stories and the connections 
of why things are important to one stakeholder group on a campus versus another, and to be able to be in um, community with them to know what is meaningful for them. When um, Kevin used the example of he had to, he and his colleagues knew they had to do a lot of listening with over a thousand touch points of people. That is hearing so that they could weave together and understand whose perspectives are born out of experiences that maybe they don't have or another group doesn't have, but it helps them lead um, UVA in a way that's more effective because they have these parts of the tapestry of the campus's history over time and currently. So that's the, the notion of it. So it's a metaphor out of the tapestry to say, thinking about Weaver in a much more um, broader, but yet also connected way of how we engage with people in the spaces of vulnerability around this work, and try, which means we have to be comfortable of hearing those stories and comfortable of sitting with those stories and not, I, I hear so many leaders, you know, they wanna hear the story only once, like, oh, I already heard that. And then they're done with it. And yet the other, there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of um, uh, anger and a lot of mistrust. And you're asking people to move forward with the university into our new initiatives, but you haven't allowed people to understand that when I was a student there, or when I, when I was a professor or whatever, or a staff member, this is what happened to me. Those stories are gonna be repeated. And so we have to have the capacity to be able to sit with that, to hear that, and to weave that in a way into our understanding of what we're trying to um, advance in our community. So it's a concept that's not born out of traditional, um, it, it came out of our work, not out of the traditional leadership field of this is this kind of leader, but out of the newness of what's required to be engaged in these spaces of vulnerability and to be able to capture some of this work in real time. We have too many leaders, we believe, who are showing up in very traditional ways of being transactional, thinking they're being transformative, but don't want to hear the, don't want to be on the ground with people, don't want to hear the struggles and the stories and figure out how they fit. You know, we want to sweep our problems under the rug rather than acknowledging them and saying, listen, this is a part of what's made, like, you know, for us, for Lieutenant Richard Collins' murder on our campus, you know, we're, we have to deal, we, we have to embrace that, deal with that, and work with his family and the foundation to move that in a better position. But if we swept it under the carpet and act like it didn't happen, that's not weaving it into what is the reality of what it means to be um, it, part of Maryland's history. I know it's a little long. I hope that answered for the person. Yeah, can I just say um, two things? I was going to be quiet, but you said two things that I think um, um, I've just experienced, right? Uh, the, the notion of, of leaders not wanting to lean into that discomfort, the notion of being conflict averse yes. um, is a huge Achilles heel. The students at the University of Missouri said they, the protest didn't just happen. It didn't just drop out of thin air. They actually said they were trying to engage administration two years prior to the protest. Yes. Right, but they were rebuffed at every corner. Right, they meetings were set and then canceled. There was a level of discomfort to hear from them. The notion of wanting to lean into those difficult conversations, where I mean, you know, the students would knock on doors, right, and they they wouldn't even answer. They knew they were there, um, and even here, uh, the there's there might be some leadership who have said, um, "I didn't realize how important these conversations yeah. were in the community." And, and I mean, this notion that you can have like one conversation on uh, uh, the, the university's uh, role in slavery and be done. Right, exactly. It's almost, yeah, it's almost laughable. And, um, but, um, and the community basically is saying, look, we'll have this as many times as we need to have it. And, yeah. and we want you to sh show up, to lean in, to listen to us, to be empathetic, to understand, don't be defensive. Um, cause that's just going to add like 20 more meetings onto this. Um, yeah. and, and I, but I think it's real. It is so real and, and such an, uh, an Achilles heel, um, in leadership and, and leadership, uh, um, roles. I, I, I want to ditto it a thousand times over and maybe take this little segment and show it to some people because we're, this is happening all over the nation in ways in which we're avoiding it. And all of us as professionals have learned how to be in these spaces and have the conversation and move on. But um, in our real life and in our students' real lives, this is, and our staff on our campus, this is happening every day on and on. And so we've got to build capacity and be able to have um, these conversations. Great points, great points. So my next question is, um, given my new role as a mid manager, acknowledging student activism will continue. How would you suggest I best support my entry level staff members while navigating political challenges as a student may desire to be more vocal and visible? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. You want me to start saying it looks like you oh, have- Oh, I'm turning that right on over to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, 
come in on the tail end of that. <laughs> um, I, I think that's excellent. First of all, um, I just appreciate the vulnerability and acknowledging that to me, that's leadership, right? Acknowledging both the struggles and your growth. And, and I think first and foremost, and sharing with um, other colleagues who might be entering the field, um, that growth in and of itself is, is a, a development opportunity, right, for them. But, but, but for me, one of the things that I think is incredibly important, which I think you kind of built into your question, um, is that with the students, uh, and just give, use it, using the example that I shared before, they told me, they were very clear, they said, if you want to be successful here, given what we've already told you, we need you to engage early and often, right? Unapologetically, you need to be visible, you need to show up, you need to be transparent, uh, be vulnerable, um, uh, you need to not over-promise and under-deliver, right? Yeah, all of these things, the students were, were unapologetic. And again, they said, we don't want to just help you with the, so the issues. We want to be a part of the solution. We want to be a part of that board, that your advisory board that's moving this important work forward. And so being able to engage and not think that leadership is you going in some back room, hearing from the students and then coming back and say, okay, this is what we got for you, but engaging them every step of the way. I think that's a, 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 the, some of the best ways that you can engage um, your colleagues um, in this this work and being able to really talk about um, um, both your 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 uh, your angst and your hope your um, um, uh, your areas of affirmation things that you did well but quite honestly any missteps along the way I think your vulnerability will also allow them to recognize that you're going to both succeed and fail and your goal is to have more successes than failures it's not that you won't fail but in the end you're ju you're just by your gallop and not your stumble. So I would say all of those things, but I, I love the fact that um, you, by your own admission, have acknowledged some of that and that has allowed you to grow, you know, in your own leadership roles. You know, the last part of where you were ending up, Kevin, is where um, I want to pick up. And I do think um, when you have, new, when we have younger staff, if I recall, and there's several things to the layers of the question, but, you know, if you're bringing in younger staff doing this kind of work, I think it's important because when they're working with more senior people, they can assume they can assume we've always had the finesse and ability to handle these things. And so, taking up where Kevin just um, ended, really being as transparent as we can be about how we have continued to grow over time in our ability to handle these things and to to have, help them relax out on that, that they will develop stronger, and better skills over time. But also just checking in with them and and not putting them maybe helping to um, as we're giving them different positions and things to do to be role modeling for them how to handle some of that because in the new context of the campus they're now on, they have to learn the politics of that campus. So some of what um, I think as a, as a senior leader or someone who's hiring new people that can do is really some very intentional work of socializing them to the dynamics, but also inviting them to be creative and bring in a new voice and a new vision for how we might problem solve. Because sometimes we've been on our campuses too long or even for any period of time, we may think we have a strategy of way, but new voices and new vision are important. So empowering them to say, we want, I hired you because you have great ideas and great potential. And so working both sides of that, I think is um, really important, but the politics are very real. And so what we ask a lot of new professional staff to do matters and um, being there to support them and to protect them, I think in the sense of if they take on assignments that are you know, in a unit or in a division or around a senior leader on campus who we all know may be um, the kind of person who behaves in ways that are a little unruly or um, um, can cause problems for a, a junior staff member, being there to support them, helping them, show, showing um, part of the support and giving them confidence that you know they can do it, but also protecting some of that initially for folks because um, they, they, we need that and folks need that on, uh, um, on a campus. So I would add that to it as well. It's, it's, yes, I'll stop there. Okay. Well, I feel like on, on campuses, it's a lot easier for people to have a more open mind about these racial discussions in order to fix an issue, even when it can be difficult at times. And it still seems easier than the outside world. What about the outside of campus? How do we help in those more hostile environments and communicate with more hostile people that may, see, may they seem like they don't want to listen? And do you have any advice on how we can get people to see the racial injustices around us and get more people to help make changes. Let me start on that one. Um, you know, so I think there, there is a degree of truth to, at one level, it feels easier on our college campuses because of the nature of college campuses and our role in society and, and the way in which we've taken up this agenda, generally speaking. 
However, I would also argue that we're nice about it, but just below the surface, there are still challenges even on our college campuses. So certainly it's better. But if I think to the question about outside, um, I have found that it's even more challenging now, we know, but I look for the places where what I can go talk to people about may be able to get some traction. So for example, um, even though most of my work these days are in college campuses, I, I've, I've done some work recently with the judicial benches in the state of Maryland. And um, I, the courts actually have a lot of different unique sort of challenges around the diversity of who's showing up and all the, and of course we're not surprised given where a lot of the critical race theory work comes from, it's looking at judicial cases and decisions. But that's outside of the context of higher ed and learning. Um, and it isn't that, I mean, the court judges know how to behave, but it's finding out that people have very different ways in which they've been socialized. But even in our society, in um, social environments where there's a lot of anger and unrest, I have found these days that it's better for me to listen and hear and to understand where it's coming from more than feeling like I have an answer to come in to or a prescription, particularly outside of higher because there is a cultural context of what are people interested in in understanding. And a lot of the conflicts are happening within our communities as well as across our communities. We are as diverse as, you know, so in all of our communities, however you define community, there's tremendous diversity within our community. So some of the work has been in, for me, I'll speak for myself, even the conversations I'm having within the context of the African-American Black community around issues of political context, issues of health disparities, issues of access, issues of the diversity of our nation and what that means and who that impacts. So even those conversations um, have become more challenging. And so what I do is try to look to see, not so much in an academic way or my role as a professor, because that to me doesn't have the, that's not an appropriate way to always manage that on the outside. But I have tried to listen and see where I might be able to bring a perspective. But I've noticed more increasingly that I need to just listen and understand where people are coming from and particularly in, again, a com community that's most salient to me, um, the Black community, because I am learning increasingly of those differences within our community that I often think we don't talk about or explore as much. So that's where I would say um, it's showing up for me. Yeah, this is a, a, a another great question. We could actually have a whole session on this, and I'll tell you why. I mean, I'll try to keep this brief, but Sharon had asked me to touch on this before. This is just one approach, so you have to kind of follow me um, on this, but it does definitely relate to the question. So when I got to the University of Missouri, um, I was challenged with kind of um, uh, charting a path forward strategically, developing a strategic kind of plan. And oftentimes when we think about any type of strategic framework, we focus on the organization that we're in. Like we want to get that stuff right first. We never think about anything outside that ultimately could change a narrative and shape a narrative, right? So first and foremost, we got uh, an inclusive excellence framework established at the University of Missouri system and at the flagship campus. But I was taken out to lunch about six months after um, being there by CEOs of banks, by the mayor, by the superintendent of schools, um, chamber head of chamber of commerce and others. And they said, look, we want to get to know you. This is a get to know you lunch. We, we also want to express our extreme frustration that when the protests happened in Missouri, we were chagrined because we wanted to roll up our sleeves and work with the University of Missouri system uh, and the, the, the flagship campus there in Columbia to move this incredible work forward. The national narrative was so bad in Missouri. The NAACP had issued a travel advisory ban for the entire state because they said it was so bad with race. Don't walk, don't crawl, don't drive, don't fly into the state. Just skip us all together. And so they said- I text you, Kevin and Ash, should I come in for right. the- you did. you did, you said, you want me to come where? I mean, uh, yeah, we, yeah, we had to have a few conversations. You had to make sure it was even me, like, right. <laughs> right. But, 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 but what they said is, look, we want to get to know you for this lunch, but we won't let you leave until you give us a bold idea how we could do that because the university wanted to keep its stuff in-house, right? It didn't want us to work with them. And so I didn't have anything. And, and I just said, well, I mentioned this, this framework that we just um, moved through the university system. What if we rewrote the framework and allow, removed all the higher ed references and allowed it to serve as the backdrop for our entire city and our county? What if we rooted work around racial equity or whatever we wanted to into this framework and had a shared narrative? And they didn't laugh me out the room. They thought they had merit, they connected me with designees and then it just exploded. 
And when I came out here, I mean, we had cities, other cities like Chicago, Lafayette, Louisiana, Knoxville, Tennessee, Athens, Georgia, send contingents to little old Columbia, Missouri to replicate that with institutions in their own communities. When I came out here, the same thing happened. They were reeling from what happened in 2017. The, what do you think? And I said, I don't know if it works here, but this is what happened in Columbia, right? And we're really thinking about issues of racial equity and everything here. Um, and and so it, again, it just took off. We had organizations develop their own inclusive excellence plans and frameworks like United Way, the Charlottesville City School District, a retirement community. And then we had a chance meeting at the state and the diversity officer, my counterpart there said, I'm being charged with creating a strategic framework for state government. I said, well, why stop the state government? This is what happened in the city and the county. Why don't we do something that's unprecedented and create an inclusive excellence state? and we have the governor adopt the framework. So I'm just saying, sometimes we have not because we ask not, and we have to have a vision that's bigger than that problem, right? And, and not to localize it. And sometimes you can use what you already have existing to center the work. Even our racial equity task force work was centered in our institutional DEI strategic framework. So you can ultimately, again, kind of turn ripples into waves um, with the work. So think beyond that, think um, very creatively and innovative around the work, and you just never will know what can result. What are some tips for DEI professionals, professionals who are not in a BIPOC community, and for those who are uninformed, BIPOC is Black, Indigenous, people of color? What objectives should be kept in mind while talking about certain experiences or topics, for instance, racial discrimination? that are not directly experienced as a DEI professional who are not a member of that particular community. I ask this question because I wanna make sure the anti-racist work I do is productive, constructive, and doesn't neglect anyone of a particular group. Um, I, I'll start. Um, I, I think positionality matters. I think you have to name that upfront. I think you have to acknowledge um, that I also think you have to make sure that um, to, we're, we're possible. We're inviting others into the conversation, inviting others into the room. Um, sometimes it's great opportunity to uh, uh, be able to share in the work with cross-functional partners who represent different identities. But I, I think there's some amazing people who not who are not members of the BIPOC community doing this work. And what I really appreciate about them, I think, is 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 um, kind of lent to them being successful. Um, is the fact that they own their identity. They lean into that. That doesn't negate their passion uh, for wanting to eradicate inequities, for wanting to lean into this work. But, 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 but um, don't speak for people groups that you don't represent. You can't do that. Continue just like we all are to continue to say we're learning and growing in this work, but you are, you're rooted, you're, you're passionate um, about this work. I think that by and large, that's often received very well, approaches everything in all of our work. Um, but I think being able to acknowledge and name, you know, I do, I'm do. i doing work with our, our Native American population here, right? Our, our indigenous communities. I'm not a part of that community um, in that regard, but being able to acknowledge my own positionality doesn't negate my passion to wanna to be a collaborative partner um, to move in that work forward. I just think that is important. You have to be consistent uh, with with everyone so that no one says, well, that's not what that person said to me. Um, and so I just think that part is incredibly important. So let me stop there, Sharon, may have some other things. Yeah, I, I, I would add a couple things to what you just said and, I, and, and by no means am I suggesting this is a, it may not be a tip of work, but I think it's important to be prepared for the pushback regularly. You're gonna get pushback. Um, you're gonna get pushback initially from audiences who don't know you or who do know you over time, and, and part of that, and I think we all get pushed back in various ways, but I think sometimes, um, and I don't know this person's racial identity, but I'll, I'll just speak in terms of the experiences I've seen or had with colleagues who identify and present as white doing this work. And I think all of what Kevin said is important. You have to be um, doing it because you're committed and usually that's why people do this work. And so be prepared for the pushback that's coming and to know how to handle that pushback in a way that suits your personality and your style without being defensive, but expecting and knowing that um, that may come. But I also think it's important to have a trusted group of a couple of people who know you well, who you trust, who can regularly check in with you on how you are coming across doing this work. I have seen people over the years be very invested in this work, but may not have necessarily been, um, folks haven't shared insights around how they are coming across in doing this work. And that is as important as your commitment to it. So you could be very deeply committed, but it could appear that you're um, uh, 
not you, the person who asked this question, but sometimes the sincerity of a person or their approachability or their ability to handle the exchange of what happens in these dynamic processes. So you need a close set of people who can help you and give you real information because when you aren't from these communities, that I think becomes another layer of how people critique the engagement and interaction. So, um, you know, you have to be okay with the transparency of people telling you um, truth telling, but if you know your stuff and if you've been doing your work, your record will speak for itself. And the longevity that you have in doing this work, you will develop no, in fact, I think those, um, some of our colleagues who do this work who are not from the communities are some of the most effective in certain uh, audiences. They can get in and get to a level of engagement that I can or Kevin can or other people can. And so we need an entire community of a lot of folks doing this work, but understanding that the labor um, means that sometimes people aren't gonna like you or people aren't gonna be invested in. And I think about a couple of faculty colleagues of mine who were white, who've done research and work on this, one who never got tenure at one institution and was told point blank why they weren't gonna get tenure was because they were invested in researching and doing these issues. And so, can, you know, no surprise, but for this particular person it was a surprise, but they stayed with it throughout their career. And so what's your commitment to doing the work, whether it's a practitioner or a scholar um, matters. And if you, are, if you are as devoted to it as a lot of us are, you will do exceedingly well. Just keep checking and growing yourself as, as Kevin also mentioned, it's just very important. We're all doing that. This is a really good question. Can either, you, can either of you speak on how law enforcement agencies at your respective institutions have managed both the higher ed DEI initiatives in addition to the very public dissension between law enforcement and the community, whether internally or externally? Well, let me do, you said, I think the question was on our own communities in our own campus? Yes, on, on your own campuses. So let me, let me, I'll, I'll start because, and it's not so much, I've been at my campus for, I'm going in my 36th year being at Maryland, first as an administrator, then last 26 years as a professor. And so I haven't been as directly engaged with our police force in my work per se. However, I know that our police force has been in conversation, especially since when Lieutenant Richard Collins was murdered in 2017. Um, there was a lot of conversation, and as you would expect, with our community. And there certainly have been trends over the years where our students have felt like the campus police haven't always understood the kind of incidents. And we have a current incident going right now, not so much involving our police, but involving the kind of decisions that are made in, in um, judicial around uh, student interactions. So we have, I think, some of the same sort of enduring challenges, but for the most part, there's been engagement. We've had a diverse, a diverse police force over the years. Um, to a certain extent, but there've been conversations, but I have not been so much on the ground with our police and their work with our staff, but our current president I know has commissioned and we have several faculty who do research on um, police uh, policies and police work who work with our Prince George's County Police and our campus police. So there's engagement that is happening, but there's certainly a lot of room for um, building stronger and better relationships. I know a, co a continual kind of thing that comes up is whose party do the police show up to? Like in terms of student life, students will say as soon as black students are having any kind of engagement, the police show up in larger numbers than they do down at Frat Row or at another, which is predominantly white fraternities on our campus. So I think we have a lot of that, but in terms of on the ground working with our police, it's just not where I have been as much on our campus. So I know it's ebbs and flow and we still have a lot and we have a big group right now dealing exactly with those issues of how to demilitarize some of the actions and interactions of our police with our student um, community. So um, we're engaged in those conversations literally right now. I'm just not serving on that um, committee with our university, but it's a big effort on our campus right now. I'm gonna let that, uh, that answer stay there because I got so excited because I was like, man, there are two questions left. I've never been on a, a Zoom discussion where we've gotten through all the questions we might, Get that. I didn't want uh, Katie. I thought Katie was going to be the last question. Be like, if if, if Kevin wasn't so long winded, we got to my question. But then <laughs> the father just threw a loop on me. She just threw a question in there. So let's see if we can get to a few more. Okay. Um. We we have time for two more questions. It depends. So this question, um, diversity, equity, inclusion is becoming more of a trend instead of a very real, necessary, and relatively focused and and initiative. Those placed in these positions are merely picked to fill the bill, but to not to not necessarily do the work. In conversations with those on other campuses, there's a commonality that higher higher administrators select these individuals knowing they won't be vocal in times when it's necessary and they won't genuinely pursue the concerns and issues of those that DEI is supposed to serve. 
How do you support and promote the few works of DEI when that is the case? Is it hard to get the buy-in of students, faculty, staff, and community when they recognize this? Yes. <laughs> yes, that's tough. I mean, that's a setup, um, quite honestly, because if, if the leader is hiring someone because they want them to be a yes person, um, it's very difficult to build credibility in the community, right? I mean, we, we struggle in this work as it is, right? I, I, mean, I mean, our own, I'll just take my black community, for example, you go into an environment, they wanna know, um, are you are you gonna be down for the cause? You gonna be a hell raiser uh, or a consensus builder? Are you gonna be the house Negro, the Uncle Tom, or are you gonna be with us? And so you have to navigate those spaces. If you add an additional layer that they believe um, that that um, you will never question leadership, you're not gonna um, professionally push, you're not gonna raise these issues, um, it's gonna be very difficult to have the respect needed to kind of move this important work. And you cannot do be effective at this work without um, engaging the community and having their support. So let me just stop there. And no, I mean, I, I, I don't know if there's much I can add except for to say this, and that is that there, I have certainly seen over the years where some um, leaders who've had this portfolio, whether it was a CDO role or another role, um, have actually stepped down as a result of that. So they've actually said, you know what? And in some cases, and, and I will say, honestly, in a few cases, they actually have faculty status and were tenured. So they pushed back. And that's actually why some people push and say, but I don't believe it has to just be a tenured professor does this. I do think leaders on the opposite side, I try to talk to leaders to say, you will serve yourself better if you actually hire people who will really tell you the truth and represent communities well. So we got to work on the other side of that and let our um, other leaders know that you're doing yourself a disservice to get someone who you think is just going to make nice with you. Um, they need to be able to have respectability in the in the community. Well, listen, I know we're, we have actually a few more questions, but we're out of time. I guess, you know, same back time, same back channel next year, join us or coming out of here. But um, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Christine Taylor. Dr. Taylor. Thank you, Brandon. Oh, our deepest gratitude to Dr. Sharon Freeze Britt and Dr. Kevin McDonald. What a way to get started with this virtual event. So, so many things to think about and think through. And, and, and our thanks to you for, for bringing us uh, some powerful words today. I feel very engaged about where we need to go and where we will go informed by the work that you have been doing. Uh, for our audience, thank you for joining us today. One quick uh, reminder about uh, tomorrow um, is that our lecture tomorrow, our presentation tomorrow will be by Dr. Richard Fordin. His topic is Hard White, the Mainstreaming of Racism in American Politics. And then in part, following up on the recommendation of our panel, we'll conclude this three-part webinar series with uh, self-preservation, an act of political warfare. Yes. That will be hosted by Dr. Martha Crowther. You'll be getting um, an evaluation. We ask that you do complete it and send it back because we want to have an idea about how this, uh, I, I know it's going to be excellent, excellent, excellent because it has been riveting and powerful and positive. To Dr. Brandon Wolf, thank you so much. To our president, Dr. Uh, Paulette Dilworth, we thank you. And until tomorrow, same time, 12 noon until 1.30. Many thanks, much gratitude, stay safe. We appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. Bye.